Hello, friends, family, and members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This is Marlene from Building Zion, and today I wanted to share some things about repentance. Uh, before I actually get started, I um, just want to remind everyone that this and other papers I've written will be posted at uh, www.buildingzionlds.com. Dot blogspot.com and um, so you can go there and they're not the papers aren't uh, downloadable but you can just copy and paste them into a word processor and they'll function um, you know you can uh, rearrange cut paste you know how um, you want also I, uh, I fully acknowledge that I am not the most amazing at spelling and grammar, and if uh, me and my friend Spellcheck have missed something, um, I apologize. You can correct that on your own if you like. I, um, I just feel that I, I can't spend tons and tons of time fixing the spelling and I, I mean I fix as much as I can but but really fixing the spelling and grammar you know especially because I'm not really publishing these I'm not selling them they're just there for um for people to to read and, and learn on their own so I again I apologize if you're if you keep finding a bunch of errors okay so um all right, so getting into the paper for today. I feel like repentance is very mis misunderstood by some and that it's a very, very, it is very, very important that we understand what it is and its purpose to be able to come to people that can actually go out and build Zion. So I often hear people talk about repentance and its process as a punishment. I feel like God is punishing me or I'm being punished by the bishop. We have to stop thinking that. There's no more time for acting and feeling like little kids being punished by our parents. Repentance is 100% a gift. It is a gift. It is one of the biggest, most important gifts we have been given by our Heavenly Father. I think the gift of repentance is best explained in Alma chapter 42. In chapter 42, we are reading the last of the four chapters written by Alma's son, Cori, uh, written to Alma's son, Corianton, who was lifted up in pride and boasting and who also left his mission to follow after the harlot Isabel. In these chapters, Alma is teaching his son about the grievousness of his sin and of many things that Corianton did not fully understand. Alma could also perceive some of the things that were worrying Corianton, among which were the resurrection of the dead, restoration, and uh, in uh, Alma 31, 3, 3, 3, 3 through 4, he tells about uh, the, the sort of restoration that was worrying him. He says, And it is requisite with the justice of God that men should be judged according to their works. And if their works were good in this life, and the desires of their hearts were good, that they should also, at the last day, be restored unto that which is good. And if their works were evil, they shall be restored unto them for evil. Therefore all things shall be restored to their proper order, everything to its natural frame. So it wasn't uh, like the restoration of the church. It, it was... Um, restoration of, of all things good to good and all things evil to evil. And then he was also concerned in his mind about the justice of God. In chapter 42, Alma uh, breaks down the justice of God, allowing us to then see how it is that repentance is a blessing. So let's go through that chapter and as we read you will see some quotes I have included from other sources that I have highlighted in purple and the parts highlighted in yellow are my own words. Alright starting Alma chapter 42 verse 1. 
And now, my son, I perceive there is somewhat more that doth worry your mind, which you cannot understand, which is concerning the justice of God in the punishment of the sinner. For ye do try to suppose that it is injustice that the sinner should be consigned to a state of misery. So before we continue, we need to establish what is justice. Justice is the law of the universe and the law of God. It is the law that God lives by to always act justly. To act justly is to act in a righteous, morally correct, and fair manner. To act unjustly is the opposite of what God is, and He, and if he ever acted unjustly, he would cease to be God. At LDS.org, under Gospel Topics, justice is described as, quote, In scriptural terms, justice is the unchanging law that brings consequences for actions. Because of the law of justice, we receive blessings when we obey God's commandments. The law of justice also demands that a penalty be paid for every sin we commit. Close quote. Acts 10, 34 through 35 says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. God is no respecter of persons. Everyone, no matter in what time, place, nationality, tribe, etc., are held to the same laws of justice. Justice does not and cannot discriminate, and neither does God. DNC 120, 20 through 21. There is a law irrevocably decreed in heaven before the foundation of the world upon which all blessings are predicated. And when we obtain any blessing from God, it is by obedience to the law upon which it is predicated. So likewise, if we look at the other side of the coin, the law of justice says any punishment or condemnation we obtain from God is by a lack of of obedience or transgression of that law upon which it is predicated. The laws of justice must be answered or fulfilled. Not even God can deny, change, or transgress the laws of justice. Okay, going back to Alma 42, verse 2. Now behold, my son, I will explain this thing unto thee. For behold, after the Lord God sent our first parents forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence they were taken, yea, he drew out the man, and he placed at the east end of the Garden of Eden cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the tree of life. So why did Adam and Eve have to leave the garden? They transgressed the law and their bodies and spirits could no longer abide a terrestrial world. It was a transgression to eat the fruit because God told them not to partake of the fruit. They knew better. They were however ignorant to what they were however ignorant to what going against the law of God would truly mean because they were innocent. They did not yet understand right from wrong or good from evil. Satan beguiled or tricked Eve by lying to her, then telling her only a half-truth about her, ac- about her actions, and because of her ignorance and innocence, she believed him. He told her in Moses 4, 10-11, And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Let's look first at the difference between a sin and a transgression. First, sin at LDS.org under topics is described as To commit a sin is to willfully disobey God's commandments or to fail to act righteously despite a knowledge of the truth. Sin results in the withdrawal of the Holy Ghost. It makes the one who sins unable to dwell in the presence of Heavenly Father, for no unclean unclean thing can dwell with God. Through Jesus Christ and his atonement, each person can repent and be forgiven of sins. 
Elder Dallin H. Oaks explained the difference between sin and transgression in the 1993 October conference. He said, quote, The contrast between a sin and a transgression reminds us of the careful wording in the second article of faith. We believe that man will be punished for their own sins and not for Adam's transgression. It also echoes a familiar distinction in the law. Some acts, like murder, are crimes because they are inherently wrong. Other acts, like operating without a license, are crimes only because they are legally prohibited. Under these distinctions, the act that produced the fall was not a sin, inherently wrong, but a transgression, wrong because it was formally prohibited. These words are not always used to denote something different, but in this distinction, but this distinction seems meaningful in the circumstances of the fall. Close quote. We can compare this in our own homes to a child telling the parent a lie. This is inherently wrong and is therefore a sin, and those children eight and over are then held accountable for that sin because they have reached an age in which they can begin to understand right from wrong, good from evil, and can understand consequences of actions. Now, if there is a family rule to not eat snacks before dinner, and the child does anyway, this would be considered a transgression. It is a transgression because it is not inherently wrong, but it is a family rule to protect the child from not being hungry when dinner comes, eating too much, and or becoming sick. Sins, because they are inherently wrong, justice will always have hold on us. Transgressions, according to Elder Oaks, was a law of God was a law God gave Adam and Eve prohibiting the action of eating the fruit. It was something that was formally prohibited by God at that time. The question must then be asked, are we held accountable to justice for a transgression just as we are a sin? Yes, God is just. So when God gives a commandment, to transgress the commandment or law is still subject to the laws of justice. Let's look now at how Satan beguiled Eve. The lie he told her was, You shall not surely die. They did not die immediately, but eating of the fruit changed their bodies so that they began became mortal and would and would in time die. They did, however, immediately die spiritually. Spiritual death is a separation of the human soul from the presence of God. We came to earth to become like our Father in heaven. Satan told Eve how she could become like him. Eat of the fruit was the action. But Satan only told her one half of the consequences for that action. And ye shall be as the gods, knowing good from evil. She came to know good from evil, but Satan did not tell her that because she transgressed the law, justice would have hold on her and drag her down. Eating the fruit and transgressing the law physically changed her body from a terrestrial body to a telestial body. Her spirit had also become corrupted so that neither her body nor spirit could abide the presence of a terrestrial world. By her actions, she was drugged down, well, her and Adam, were drugged down out of the terrestrial garden of Eden to the telestial world we now live in. Going back to Alma 42, verse 3. Now we see that the man had become as God, knowing good and evil and lest he should put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, the Lord God placed cherubim and the flaming sword that he should not partake of the fruit. So here we need to establish exactly what is the fruit of the tree of life. 
in 1st Nephi 11, 25 through 27 and 32 through 33 says, And it came to pass that I beheld that I beheld that the rod of iron, which my father had seen, was the word of God, which led to the fountain of living waters, or to the tree of life, which waters are a representation of the love of God. And I also beheld that the tree of life was a representation of the love of God. And the angel said unto me, Look, and behold the condensation of God. And I looked and beheld the Redeemer of the world, of whom my father had spoken. And I also beheld the, the prophet who should prepare the way for him. And the Lamb of God went forth and was baptized of him. And after he was baptized, I beheld the heavens open, and the Holy Ghost came down out of heaven and abide upon him in the form of a, of a dove. And it came to pass that the angel spake unto me again, saying, Look, and I looked and beheld the Lamb of God, and he was taken by the people, yea, the Son of the everlasting God was judged of the world. And I saw and bear record, and I, Nephi, saw that he was lifted up upon the cross and slain for the sins of the world. Here an angel explains to Nephi that the tree of life is the love of God. And then the angel tells him to look, and Nephi sees the condense condescension of God and the Redeemer of the world, or Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ that is God's manifestation of love. Why? Because his children, whom he loved the most, and also, sorry, why? Because his child, whom he loved the most, and who also loved him the most, was perfect even in premortality, and had already obtained godhood. So this is Christ. God sacrificed Christ to save all his other children. He sent his most beloved son, who was already a god, a perfect celestial being, down to a telestial world. The sacrifice was great because none other could have done what Christ did. If Christ failed, all of God's children, including his most beloved Christ, would have been lost to the demands of justice. Christ had to live a perfect life, never succumbing to the temptations of the devil. Christ had to be the perfect example for us. Christ had to atone for the sins of the world, thus satisfying the demands of justice. Then die, then die, having gone to the slaughter an innocent lamb, and then resurrect, breaking the bands of death. The love of God was a sacrifice that gave everything so that not only he, but we could gain everything. So if Adam and Eve had reached out and partaken of the fruit in their sins, the fruit being the manifestation of the pure love of God, which was resurrection from physical death and pure knowledge of the love of God, which if eaten, having not gone through the steps of repentance, having a perfect knowledge of God and his love, they would have lived forever maintaining their sins, and been condemned to live forever in their sins, having been claimed by the demands of justice. Uh, this is a quote from Brother Jan E. Newsom, Second Counselor in the Sunday School General Presidency, from the February 2021 Leahona. So this, um, this message was... Uh, the name of it was The Worth of Each Soul, and it was just a couple months ago that it came out in February. He said, quote, When Nephi was questioned by an angel concerning the condescension of God, he humbly replied, I know that he loveth his children. Nevertheless, I do not know the meaning of all things. Why was God willing to let his son serve as a sacrifice? Why did he send us here to be proven and tried? Because, as taught in an equally beautiful truth, 
the worth of souls is great in the sight of God. Why are we of such great value to him? Naturally, because we are his children, he loves us. This is my work and my glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. President Russell M. Nelson explained, Too many people consider rep repentance a punishment, something to be avoided except in the most serious circumstances. But this feeling of being penalized is, an engen is engendered by Satan. He tries to block us from looking to Jesus Christ, who stands with open arms, hoping and willing to heal, forgive, cleanse, strengthen, purify, and sanctify us. Nothing is more liberating, more ennobling, or more crucial to our individual progression than is a regular daily focus on repentance. Repentance is not an event. It is a process. It is the key to happiness and peace of mind. When coupled with faith, repentance opens our access to the power of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Close quote. All right, returning to Alma 42, verse 4. And thus we see that there was a time granted unto men to repent, yea, a probationary time, a time to repent and serve God. Um, in the 1989 April Conference, Elder L. Tom Perry of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained the purpose of the probationary time called mortality. Quote, the main purpose of earth life is to allow our spirits, which existed, which existed before the world was, to be united with our bodies for a time of great opportunity in mortality. The association of the two together has given us the privilege of growing, developing, and maturing as only we can with spirit and body united. With our bodies, we pass through a certain amount of trial in what is termed a probationary state of our existence. This is a time of learning and testing to prove ourselves worthy of eternal opportunities. It is a part of a divine plan of our Heavenly Father has for his children. Close quote. Okay, back to Alma 42, verse 5. For behold, if Adam had put forth his hand immediately and partaken of the tree of life, he would have lived forever according to the word of God, having no space for repentance. Yea, and also the word of God would have been void, and the great plan of salvation would have been frustrated. But behold, it was appointed unto man to die. Therefore, as they were cut off from the tree of life, they should be cut off from the face of the earth. And man became lost forever, yea, they became fallen man. So without intercession, or someone answering, or paying the price of justice, we would be lost forever, left to pay the price for our own faults and errors, being forever cut off from the presence of God, living forever in a fallen state. Um, I'm going back to verse 7. And now ye see by this that our first parents were cut off, both temporally and spiritually, from the presence of the Lord. And thus we see they being subjects to follow after their own will. Our own will, if you look up the footnote of verse 7, reads, Agency. When Adam and Eve ate the fruit because of their choice, they cut themselves off. As do we when we sin or transgress the law. We cut ourselves off spiritually and temporally from the presence of the Lord. It is an act of mercy that that we were given a probationary time to use our newly gained free agency to choose our father and choose to be just beings or to choose to be unjust beings, which is to rebel against our father, becoming subject to the demands of justice and the devil. Second Nephi 9.6 reads, for as death hath passed upon all men to fulfill the merciful plan of the great creator, 
there must needs be a power of resurrection, and the resurrection must needs come unto man by reason of the fall, and the fall came by reason of transgression, and because man became fallen, they were cut off from the presence of the Lord. Okay, going back to Alma 42, now verses 8 through 10. Now behold, it is not expedient that man should be reclaimed from this temporal death, for that would destroy the great plan of happiness. Therefore, as the soul could never die, and the fall had brought upon all mankind a spiritual death as well as a temporal, that is, they were cut off from the presence of the Lord, it was expedient that mankind should be reclaimed from this spiritual death. Therefore, as they had become carnal, sensual, and devilish by nature, this probationary state became a state for them to prepare to become a preparatory state. Sorry, for them to prepare, it became a preparatory state. The soul is the combination of the spirit and the body. In their terrestrial form in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were immortal. They could not die physically nor spiritually, but they chose to eat the fruit. God has the power to reclaim us from temporal death by translation. But as we stand, but as we, uh, sorry, but as was stated in verse 8, if God had just decided to reclaim us physically from the fall by translating us, we would have lost the gift of being able to live through a probationary state that allows us to take advantage of the gift of repentance, which qualifies us to be covered by the redeeming power of the atonement and become by our own will and become by our own will and choices terrestrial and eventually celestial beings able to enter back into the presence of the Father. All right, back to Alma 42, uh, doing verses 11 through 14. Uh, okay, and now remember, my son, if it were not for the plan of redemption, laying it aside, as soon as they were dead, their souls were miserable, being cut off from the presence of the Lord. And now there was no means to reclaim men from the fallen state, which man had brought upon himself, being of his own disobedience. Therefore, according to justice, the plan of redemption could not be brought about only on conditions of repentance of man in this probationary state. Yea, this probationary state, for except it were for the, these conditions, mercy could not take effect, except it should destroy the work of justice. Now the work of justice could not be destroyed. If so, God would cease to be God. And thus we see that all mankind were fallen, and they were in the grasp of justice. Yea, the justice of God, which consigned them forever to be cut off from his presence. No matter how much anyone points the finger at another purse at other people or claim, the devil made me do it. When we sin, we are in a fallen state spiritually, having cut ourselves off from the presence of God. God cannot then just wave a magic magic wand, for that would go against the laws of justice, and God would cease to be God. He cannot just wave a magic wand and remove us from our probationary telestial fallen state to a uh, terrestrial or celestial state. Yes, we were born in a telestial state as a baby, being innocent. We were not cut off spiritually. We became cut off spiritually when we ourselves began to sin. We must then put in the work we must then put in the work to go through the process of repentance, which is a gift given us by means of the atonement of Jesus Christ to be again raised spiritually from the dead. Alma 42, verse 15. And now the plan of mercy could not be brought about except an atonement should be made. Therefore God himself atoneth for the sins of the world to bring about the plan of mercy, to appease the demands of justice, 
that God might be a perfect, just God and a merciful God also. In the February 2021 Leahona, so again, this was just a couple months ago, Elder Neil A. Anderson shared a message entitled, The Gift of Forgiveness. He said, quote, When a law or commandment is given and a punishment affixed, that punishment is not the punishment executed by justice, as justice would have us answer for the full extent of our transgression. The punishment given does not even begin to pay the price of justice. In our pre-mortal world, we rejoiced with the opportunity to come to earth, receive a mortal body, and become more like our Heavenly Father. We knew, however, that we would experience disappointment, sickness, pain, injustice, temptation, and sin. These challenges were anticipated in the Father's plan of redemption, and He called upon His only begotten Son to be our Redeemer and Savior. Jesus Christ would come to earth like no other. And through his righteousness, he would break the bands of death. As we choose to follow him and repent of our sins, he eliminates through his infinite atonement our mistakes and sins found in the book of life. Our repentance, followed by forgiveness from the Savior of the world, is the foundation of our prayers and efforts to return to our heavenly home. Elder Neal A. Maxwell of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained, If we choose the course of discipleship, we will move from what may be initially a mere acknowledgement of Jesus on to the admiration of Jesus, then on to adoration of Jesus, and finally to emulation of Jesus. In that process of striving to become more like him, we must be in the posture of repentance. Repentance becomes a continual thought, a constant effort. President Russell M. Nelson has said, Nothing is more liberating, more ennobling, or more crucial to our individual progression than is a regular daily focus on repentance. Experience the strengthening power of daily repentance, of doing and being a little better each day. We must remember, however, that the divine gift of forgiveness can never be earned. It can only be received. Yes, commandments must be obeyed and ordinances observed to receive forgiveness. But personal effort, no matter how great, pales in comparison to the cost of redemption. In fact, there is no comparison. Forgiveness is a gift, and the only one who can give the gift is the Redeemer and Savior of the world. Jesus Christ, um, sorry, the only one that can give it is the Redeemer and Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. He offers his priceless gift willingly to all who turn to him and receive it. As President Nelson said, the Savior's atonement is able to redeem every soul from the penalties of personal transgression on conditions that he has set. Returning to Alma 42, verses 16 and 17. Now repentance could not come unto men except there were a punishment, which also was eternal, as the life of the soul should be affixed opposite to the plan of happiness, which was a eternal as also the life of the soul. Now how could a man repent except he should sin? How could he sin if there was no law? How could there be a law save there was a punishment? Because we are eternal beings, the effect sin has on us is eternal. So just as the punishment for sin is eternal, so had to be an opposite eternal effect, the atonement to answer for the sin. The gift of repentance allows us to learn and grow. It allows us to learn to be just, or rather, learn to become as God who is just. In the Garden of Eden, God gave Adam and Eve a law. Do not eat of the fruit of the tree, and multiply and replenish the earth. They broke the first part of the law by eating of the fruit. Because of the law, there was a punishment. 
the punishment required them to leave the garden, to till the ground, and live by the sweat of their brow all their days. Did their punishment pay the price for their actions? No. Their punishment allowed them to partake of the gift of repentance, which allowed them to partake of the atonement of Jesus Christ, which does pay for the price for their sins or transgressions, and allowed them to learn and grow in understanding of what is just, thus becoming as God who is just. There are some who believe that this means that there should be no law or commandment, because then there would be no punishment. Let's look at what that would look like. If God never gave Adam and Eve any laws or commandments, they would still, to this day, be living in the Garden of Eden. They would still be as the animals, not knowing right from wrong. They would never have come to learn or grow or come to be as God, knowing good from evil. To understand good from evil, we have to be told what is good and evil. We are told in the form of laws and commandments. When good is enacted, there are natural consequences in the form of blessings. When evil is enacted, there are natural consequences in the form of punishments. To better understand this, let's break down verse 17 backwards. The third question in verse 17 states, How could there be a law, save there be a punishment? We know that because of the demands of justice, there is a punishment. Because there is a punishment, God has given us a law to teach us right from wrong, and that if we break the law, justice will demand the punishment. It is an act of mercy that God has given us laws. It is by the law, when we follow them, that we are justified and escape the punishment. So now we know that God gave us laws <clears throat> to teach us right from wrong and to teach us how to escape the punish punishment demanded by justice. The second question states, how could we sin if there was no law? Because of the mercy of being given a law, we learn right from wrong. Choosing then to go against the law constitutes a sin. The third question states, or rather the first question in verse 17, let me fix that, even though we're, we're talking about a third. The first question states, how could a man repent except he should sin? Because we sin, we are then enabled to take advantage of the gift of repentance. That repentance allows the cleansing and healing effect of the atonement to take effect in our lives, thus satisfying the demands of justice. Back to Alma 42, verses 18 through 21. Now there is a punishment affixed and a just law given, which brought remorse of conscience unto a man. Now if there was no law given, if a man murdered, he should die. That's the example of the law that Alma is given. If a man should murder, he should die. Would he be afraid he would die if he should murder? And also, if there is no law given against sin, men would not be afraid to sin. So if you were to go into the woods, so this is my example, if you were to go into the woods and chop down a tree and it fell down, would you be afraid that the tree fell? I mean, unless it like fell on you, but no, of course not. What else is a tree going to do when you cut it down but fall? But if God found it unjust for the tree to fall and gave a law stating that if a tree is cut down, it shall not fall, now you would be afraid to let the tree fall and you would do everything in your power to not let it fall. President Spencer W. Kimball, he spoke, let's see, when was this? Oh, this is from The Miracle of Forgiveness that he wrote in uh, 1969. So he spoke of the value of a sensitive consciousness. Quote, 
How wonderful that God should endow us with this sensitive yet strong guide we call a conscience. Someone has aptly remarked that conscience is a celestial spark which God has put into every man for the purpose of saving his soul. Certainly, it is the instrument which awakens the soul to consciousness of sin, spurs a person to make up his mind to adjust to convince himself of the transgression without soft soft peddling or minimizing the error, to be willing to face facts, meet the issue, and pay necessary penalties. And until that person is in this frame of mind, he has not begun to repent. To be sorry is an approach. To abandon the act of error is a beginning. But until one's conscience has been sufficiently stirred to cause him to move in cause him to move in the matter so long as there are excuses and rationalizations, one has hardly begun to approach his approach to forgiveness. This is what Alma meant in telling his son Corianton that none but the truly penitent are saved. Okay, returning now to verse 21. And if there was no law given, if men sinned, what could justice do or mercy either? For they would have no claim upon the creature. For any of you out there who are still saying to yourselves, yeah, but if God didn't give us commandments, then we wouldn't sin and then justice would have no hold on us to punish and drag us down. And essentially you would be right, but as I said before, if God never gave us laws, we would be as the animals. I mean, if Adam and Eve were even allowed to have children because they couldn't have children until they themselves left the garden, but if we did somehow make it here to earth, we would be as the animals, not knowing right from wrong. With no law, justice would have no hold on us, but we would also receive no mercy. We would not know right from wrong and would never be able to become as our Father in heaven. We would never be able to progress. Going back to verse 22, but there is a law given and a punishment affixed and a repentance granted which repentance merely claimeth otherwise, justice claimeth the creature, and executeth the law. And the law inflicteth the punishment. If not so, the works of justice would be destroyed, and God would cease to be God. Punishment and repentance are two sides of the same coin. Because Heavenly Father wants us to become as Him, He gave us a law. When we break the law, there is a punishment that teaches us that what we did was unjust. But there is also a repentance that teaches us how to not be unjust, but rather just. Back to Alma 42, verses 23 through 25. But God ceaseth not to be God, and mercy claimeth the penitent, and mercy cometh because of the atonement. And the atonement bringeth to pass the resurrection of the dead. And the resurrection of the dead bringeth back men into the presence of God. And thus they are restored into his presence to be judged according to their works, according to the law of justice. For behold, justice exerciseth all his demands, and also mercy claimeth all which is her own. And thus none but the truly penitent are saved. What do you suppose that mercy can rob justice? I say unto you, nay, not one whit. If so, God would cease to be God. Because Christ completed his mission, we will all be resurrected and be restored to the presence of God. That does not mean, however, that we will remain in his presence. Justice and mercy are also two sides of the same coin. When we break a law, 
justice eternally has claim on us. When we repent, we allow the atonement of Jesus Christ and his mercy to answer for us and eternally satisfy the demands of justice. Those who did not repent and did not accept Christ's mercy through the atonement will have to answer to the laws of justice and will be removed from the presence of God as they will not even be able to abide staying in, his pres- staying in the presence of God. Just as Adam and Eve fell from the presence of God, so will those who do not take advantage of the gift of repentance and let Christ's mercy answer for us. It is only those who do not take advantage of the gift of repentance, having been cleansed by the atonement. Sorry, I read that wrong. It is only those who do take advantage of the gift of repentance, having been cleansed by the atonement and letting Christ's mercy answer for us, who will be able to abide remaining in the presence of the Father. Um, Let's see, this was, okay, President Boyd K. Packer, President of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles in the 1977 April Conference. He explained that the Savior's sacrifice allows mercy to be extended to us without violating the law of justice. Quote, each of us lives on a kind of spiritual credit. One day the account will be closed, a settlement demanded. However casually we may view it now, when the day comes and the foreclosure is imminent, we will look around in restless agony for someone, anyone, to help us. And, by eternal law, mercy cannot be extended, save there be one who is both willing and able to assume the debt and pay the price and arrange the terms for our redemption. Unless there is a mediator, unless we have a friend, the full weight of justice, untempered, unsympathetic, must positively, uh, must, positively must fall on us. The full recompense for every transgression, however minor or however deep, will be exacted from us to the utmost farthing. But knowing this, truth, glorious truth, proclaims there is such a mediator. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, and uh, men, the man, Jesus Christ. Through him, mercy can be fully extended to each of us without offending the eternal law of justice. This truth is the very root of Christian doctrine. The extension of mercy will be automatic. It will be through covenant with him. It will be on his terms, his generous terms, which include, as an absolute essential, baptism by immersion for the remission of sins. All mankind can be protected by the law of justice. And at what, let's see, all mankind can be protected by the law of justice, and at once, each of us individually may be extended the redeeming and healing blessing of mercy. Close quote. All right, going back to Alma 42, verses 26 through 31. And thus God bringeth about his great and eternal purposes, which are prepared from the foundation of the world. And thus cometh about the salvation and the redemption of men, and also their destruction and misery. Therefore, O my son, whosoever will come, Whosoever will come may come and partake of the waters of life freely, and whosoever will not come, the same is not compelled to come. But in that last day it shall be restored unto him according to his deeds. If he has desired to do evil and has not repented in his days, behold, evil shall be done unto him according to the restoration of God. And now, my son, I desire that ye should let these things trouble you no more, and only let your sins trouble you with that trouble which shall bring you down to repentance. O my son, I desire that you should deny the justice of God no more. Do not endeavor to excuse yourself in the least point because of your sins. By denying the justice of God... But do not let the justice of God and his mercy and his long-suffering have full sway in your hearts 
and let it bring you down to the dust of humility. And now, my son, ye are called of God to preach the word unto this people. And now, my son, go thy way, declare the word of truth and soberness, that thou mayest bring souls unto repentance, that the great plan of mercy may have claim upon you. And may God grant unto you even according to my words. Amen. Because of the gift of repentance and Christ's atoning blood, we can become more than the animals. We can become more than who Adam and Eve were in the garden. To be as God, we had to come to know the good from the bad and the right from the wrong. We had to have been given our free agency to choose between good and bad. And because not a single one of us were already perfected as Christ was, we would all sin, causing us to die spiritually and become subject to the demands and punishment of justice, which, because we are eternal beings, would be an eternal punishment separating us for forever from our Heavenly Father. But because Christ, a perfected being, completed his mission to die and atone for us, if we take advantage of the gift of repentance, Christ's mercy can take claim on us and justice will have no power to bind us. Our very natures become changed through the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. It is through the atonement of Jesus Christ that we can literally become as our Father in heaven. Alma 13.11 says, Therefore, they were called after this holy order and were sanctified and their garments were washed white through the blood of the Lamb. 1 Nephi 12.11 These are made white in the blood of the Lamb because of their faith in Him. My understanding, even after studying this topic and writing this paper, of the magnificence of the atonement and of what Christ has done for me, I know, is still so finite. I don't think in most cases that we do or can even begin to comprehend the magnitude of the atonement and what it would truly mean if Christ had failed. We owe Christ and our Father in Heaven everything, absolutely everything. To restate what Elder Neil L. Anderson said, A. Anderson said, quote, Forgiveness is a gift, and the only one who can give the gift is the Redeemer and Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. He offers his priceless gift willingly to all who return to receive it. Forgiveness is a gift given as an effect of the gift of repentance. It is a gift. It cannot be earned or bought. It can only be given and is given freely to all who will take it. Our Heavenly Father is literally offering exaltation to everyone. He is literally offering the ability to become as our Father and to live with Him and to live with Him to everyone. As God is no respecter of persons, everyone has the exact same chance and opportunity. We just have to accept the gift. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.